welcome in and I'm glad you found our virtual walks and hikes. Usually we would be having all kinds of explorations, including butterfly walks out at our preserves. But um, as you can imagine, uh, we have gone virtual this year. So I'm glad you could join us and check out and learn a bit more about the nature of Central Oregon mm. here from your computer. So I am going to go ahead and uh, be facilitating for us today. So if you have any issues or any troubles at all, you can message me in the chat box, either privately or to the whole group. Um, and I will be able to help out as I can. Likewise, uh, we should have time for questions to ask at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions, please do send those over via the chat box or jot them down for later. And I will help ask those to um, our monarch scientist today. Um, so without further ado, um, we'll get started with today's presentation, Magnificent Monarchs. Um, so the Land Trust has started work on conserving monarchs in our area, but I won't talk too much about that because our speaker today has all the info you might need on that. Um, today, we're going to hear from Amanda Egertson. She's the Stewardship Director at the Deschutes Land Trust. I'm actually sitting in her old office right now, but um, she's going to be sharing about our work with monarch butterflies and also about monarch butterflies in general, as well as a few other butterfly things to know. Um, she helps to care for and protect all of our properties. And um, her team is super busy this time of year monitoring those properties and working on new and exciting upcoming projects, including Rimrock Ranch. I don't know if you heard that we just recently announced a protection on Rimrock Ranch. You can learn more about that um, on our website, which I'll attach the link to. Um, but without further ado, our Stewardship Director, Amanda Egertson, I will let you take it away. Hey, everybody. I got to see little glimpses of some of your faces as you were logging in. So great to see you, if only for a nanosecond. Good to just know that you're out there. Um, and while Rebecca is in my office, I'm sitting on my bedroom floor. <laughs> Uh, and so I've let my family and my cats know what's going on this hour. Hopefully um, it'll be smooth and we won't have interruptions, but if they happen, they happen. <laughs> we'll roll with it. Um, so before I dive in to the Magnificent Monarchs, um, just a little bit about the Land Trust, the Deschutes Land Trust. We're celebrating our 25th year anniversary this year, which is really exciting. We work to conserve land throughout Central Oregon. And Rebecca, let me know a little bit about the demographics of those who are joining us today. It sounds like most of you are from this region. So the Land Trust has been working here for 25 years to conserve land for wildlife, scenic views, and local communities. And we'll be working for another 25 and far into the future, hopefully, doing more of the same. And just want to take a moment to thank all of you um, here that are longtime members and supporters that we consider our Deschutes Land Trust family. And for those of you that are new, we hope that you'll stick around, check us out, uh, see what we're up to. Rebecca does an incredible job of um, keeping everybody in touch with our activities on uh, social media. Uh, so definitely tune in and learn more. Um, and thank you all for being here. All right, so let's dive in. The focus today, I'm going to try to move this poll. I don't know if that's coming up on your screen, but can't see mine. <laughs> okay, Magnificent Monarchs, the topic of discussion. For those of you who know me, you know it's my favorite topic of discussion, and I wish I could be outside sharing all of the amazing Central Oregon butterflies with you today, uh, but this is a decent substitute. You'll get to see lots of pretty pictures. Um, before we dive into monarchs, I'll just give you a quick overview of some of the butterflies that we have here in Central Oregon, um, especially those that are often confused with monarchs. We'll talk about some butterfly basics, uh, the butterfly life cycle, how does a butterfly become a butterfly, um, and then we'll, we'll dive into all things monarchs. So for those of you that may have joined the Central Oregon Butterfly uh, Zoom back in July, some of this will be uh, repeat reinforcement. So you can see how much you remember and um, 
for those of you that weren't there, you'll get some information now. And I think Rebecca um, will put in the chat or send in a follow-up email the link to that talk in case you're interested in learning more about other central organ butterflies. Okay, so we started with the poll and Rebecca, I don't know if I can see the results because now I hit it. I, we were, I was curious to know what you guys all thought about how many, oh, thank you. How many butterfly species do you think live in Central Oregon? So let me just check it out here. Rebecca, maybe you can summarize this for me. I'm trying to see it. Yeah, no problem. So thank we you. had quite a few people vote. Um, there were six people that thought there were maybe a hundred or less. Um, there were four people that thought there might be up to 150 butterflies in Central Oregon. That seems like a lot to me. Um, one person thinks maybe up to 200 and three people are pretty sure more than 200 butterfly species. So Amanda, what is the final answer? I wish. I wish. I wish we had over 200, but I think we do pretty well. We're at about 130 here in Central Oregon. Um, it's fun to, to see those poll results. I think when we did it um, for the Central Oregon Butterfly Talk, people were thinking fewer, which is the most common response. But when you think about the incredible diversity in our region, everything from the, the Badlands to the High Cascades to the Metolius River area, incredible diversity of habitats, lots of different kinds of plants, and that means lots of different kinds of butterflies. And we'll talk more about why and how those butterflies are connected to the plants as we continue. Uh, so about 130. All right, I'm gonna advance the slide and maybe try to make that poll. This, okay, we're good. All right, so into the species that often get confused with monarchs. Western tiger swallowtail, one of the big ones that gets confused. Um, and I have a little thumbnail picture of a monarch down in the corner so you can see side by side. The main difference really is yellow versus orange. The Western tiger swallowtail, which is very common in our area, about the same size as a monarch and it does have some black markings on it. And I think it's the size and the, the black markings that are the things that make people think it's a monarch, but definitely note super yellow versus super orange. So that's the tiger swallowtail. This is the probably the number one um, confusing butterfly. This is California tortoiseshells. Again, very common in our area. They go through a natural boom and bust population cycle. So for several years, we'll see thousands upon thousands, especially like on uh, mountaintops. If you're driving over one of the passes, you'll see a lot of them. You'll see a lot of them out on the trail when you're hiking. They're often down on the trail puddling. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But coloration, really similar, as you can see in the side by side there, um, but quite a bit smaller. The California tortoiseshell is smaller than the monarch and you can see the wings are um, jagged and from the picture here on the trail which is from Sue Anderson I actually th think she's maybe joining us today thank you Sue um, they're they're really designed to blend in with tree bark so when one of these butterflies closes its wings and lands on a tree you can see from the underwing uh, and the jaggedy edge of the wing that it really blends in it's a super cool adaptation um, but if you see thousands of orange butterflies, I wish they were monarchs, but they're not, unless you're in an overwintering site somewhere. <laughs> okay, another one commonly confused with the monarch is the painted lady. And we have these here as well. Again, kind of similar coloring and pattern, but smaller. Really, there's just, there's no mistaking it. Once you've seen a monarch and you see it flying, it's, it's like looking through stained glass. Um, really, really distinctive. Um, so here is another one, the Red Admiral. Now we're getting a little farther away from the pattern, but again, similar colors, right? The black, the orange, the white. Um, Red Admirals are really friendly. Super fun little tidbit. If you ever wanted to get a butterfly to land on you, try it with the Red Admiral. Um, they tend to be very friendly for some reason. <laughs> Um, so those are the, the handful of butterflies we have here in Central Oregon that are fairly common in Central Oregon that get confused with the monarch. 
uh, most of the photos that you see from here on out will be of monarchs. So hopefully we'll just get that ingrained in your head and you'll really start to zero in on the special characteristics of the monarch. And I thought it would be fun here to show you the difference between a male and a female monarch. There are so many butterfly species where you just you have no idea whether you're looking at a male or a female. There's some that do have distinct markings between the male, female, um, but many do not. The monarch is one of those that does, which is pretty cool. And you see the arrow here in the slide pointing to a little dot that's on the hind wing. This is the male. And in this other picture here, that's the female the one that's down in the corner. Um, this little dot actually on each hind wing um, emits, their, their scales that emit pheromones to attract the female. So that's how you can remember that the male is the one that has them. All right, moving on to some fun butterfly facts. I love this photo of a spring azure. This is a really common butterfly out of the Metolius Preserve um, in the, the late spring, early summer, one of the first blue butterflies to emerge. Um, pointing at the antenna on this one though, so I can let you all know that butterflies can actually smell with their antenna. Here we're pointing to the feet because they can taste with their feet, which is pretty cool if you spend a lot of time walking around on flowers. They're environmentally conscious. They carry their drinking straw with them wherever they go. Um, all butterflies have a proboscis, which I have the arrow pointing to in this photo of a Western sulfur, uh, another common butterfly species at the Metolius Preserve. Um, and the proboscis, they can unfurl when they want to drink and they stick it down into the flower to pull nectar out of the flower. Another cool thing about butterflies is that they're solar powered. It's why you don't see them flying around typically on cool cloudy days or rainy days. They're typically wings closed, hiding somewhere on those days. They really need warm sunshine to warm up their flight muscles and fly around. My rule of thumb is if, it's, if you're comfortable outside in a t-shirt, it's probably a good day to go see some butterflies. If you need to wear a sweatshirt, probably not gonna see too many. And a really, um, other really cool thing that butterflies do is sip uh, mud, sip uh, salts and minerals that they get from mud. It's called, we call it puddling. Um, I actually took this picture when I was out with Sue Anderson on a butterfly survey recently. Um, and here's a collection of a variety of different types of blue, little blue butterfly species. Uh, you can see how, how similar they look, but how you can tell some slight variations in the, de the designs on the underwings. But all of these little guys are gathered here and they're sipping up salts and minerals in the damp soil. So when you see butterflies, like in that photo of the California tortoiseshell, when you see them collected on the ground and it's damp soil, that's typically what they're doing because they can't get everything they need uh, from the nectar and the flowers. Oopsie, pushed the wrong button to advance the slide. Okay, so how does a butterfly become a butterfly? It is a miraculous journey for sure. And I'm gonna use the monarch to demonstrate how a butterfly becomes a butterfly or illustrate um, that, but all butterflies go through this evolution, this metamorphosis. So first thing, female needs to find the host plant. And what is a host plant? All butterflies have very specific plants that they will lay their eggs on. For the monarch, that's milkweed. It will not lay its egg on a rose bush or yarrow or a thistle or any other <laughs> plant. It has to be milkweed. Um, for other butterfly species, sometimes they'll have a suite of different types of plants that they'll lay their eggs on, but it's, it's very restrictive. And, and oftentimes when there's a particular butterfly that's experiencing, a population of butterflies experiencing a decline, it is typically linked, at least in part, to a lack of their host plant. Um, anyway, so female monarchs lay between 300 to 400 typically eggs. Um, Again, on milkweed, the eggs are teeny, teeny, tiny. Here you can see a picture of my, my thumb um, for scale. 
the egg and then there's a, a little um, zoom in on a monarch egg. I took that with my iPhone looking through a microscope, so it's not the best quality, but you can get a sense of how beautiful and ornate it is. And that black dot that you see at the top of the egg, that black coloring is actually the head of the caterpillar. Once the egg is laid, typically five-ish days before the egg hatches and out of the egg comes an itty bitty little caterpillar. We call them mini cats. Um, and if you look down at your pinky nail, these mini cats are smaller than the nail on your pinky finger. Tiny, really hard to see. And in the span of about two weeks, they grow about 2,000 times their original size so that they're actually as big as your index finger. So look again, look at your pinky nail and then your index finger. It is incredible. Basically all they do for two weeks straight is eat and poop, lots of poop. Um, but it's a really incredible thing to observe. And, and during that time, as you might imagine, their skin, you know, as they're growing, their skin starts to get really tight. And so they shed their skin and then they grow some more and then they shed that skin. They'll often eat the shed of their skin um, and they grow more and they go through that. For monarchs, they go through that five times. And each one of those stages is called an instar. So they have five instars and different butterflies go through different butterfly species go through different numbers of that. But for the monarchs, it's five. Once it's completed growing, it hangs upside down and forms what we call a J hook because it's like the letter J. And you can see in this picture that they've actually, they've got like a little silk pad up there where I'm moving my cursor around. And this is the back end of the caterpillar and it hangs down. <clears throat> and typically once it does this, within 12 to 24 hours, it will shed this skin that you're looking at and underneath the skin will be the chrysalis, which is incredible. So here I've got this, again, these are all taken with my iPhone, so I apologize, not the best quality, but here you see the caterpillar hanging upside down in its J. And let me just go back to this other slide. Do you see how kind of perky the antenna still are? Right before it's about to shed, those antenna become totally flaccid. They just bleh, hang straight down. And that way you know that the skin has started to pull away from that chrysalis and it's getting ready to shed. And here you can see the chrysalis is starting to, you can start to see it starting to emerge. Um, and I just have to say, when I was a kid, I thought, um, I thought the butterfly created a chrysalis kind of around itself, which is what a moth does, you know, with a cocoon, it kind of builds the structure around itself. It was a mind blower for me to, to learn that the chrysalis is actually fully formed under the skin of the caterpillar. Anyway, maybe you think that's normal. <laughs> It blew my mind. So here you can see, I, I took all these pictures, um, the skin's you know, shrinking, shrinking, and then the caterpillar like in this chrysalis is like doing this crazy herky-jerky. It looks like it's gonna fall down from its silk pad as it kind of wriggles around and gets settled in there. That final little bit of skin drops down and what you have left uh, is a beautifully formed chrysalis. And within about 24 hours, you can see, you can still see here, I'm pointing to my screen. Of course, you can't see my finger. Um, you see, you can still see the caterpillar in there, right? Like the ridges, it's totally crazy. And in about 24 hours, it hardens and it turns this glorious jade color. Uh, and it begins its amazing transformation within the chrysalis. Look at this, the gold flecking. It's like a jewel. And you can see why it's the color it is because it totally blends in with milkweed leaves. And this is a really, this really cool ridge here um, comes into play in just a second. I'll show you what the butterfly does when it comes out of its chrysalis. So egg stage, about five days. Caterpillar stage, about two weeks. Chrysalis stage really depends on ambient temperatures, typically 10 to 12 days. It could last as few as eight or nine. It could last weeks and weeks if it's really cold outside. So really depends on the temp. 
When it is time though for the butterfly to eclose, which is the word we use to describe when it emerges from its chrysalis, the, the chrysalis turns completely translucent and you can see the wings. And when you see a chrysalis like this, you know that very, very soon the butterfly is going to come out of it. Look at that fully formed wings. What's crazy is that when it comes out of the chrysalis, the wings are all kind of shriveled up and teeny tiny. And you see how large, kind of chunky the abdomen is on the butterfly. And here, the butterfly is using that ridge that I pointed out in that last photo um, to grab onto, uh, which is kind of a scary thing to watch. <laughs> As a mom, I'm like, hang on, hang on. You don't want it to fall, um, especially when the wings are so fragile and damp. Um, and then over here, the butterfly is hanging. It's pumping. It literally, you can watch the abdomen um, flexing like this. And as it does it, it pumps fluid into its wings, which continue to expand right before your eyes. And in about 15, 20 minutes, the wings are fully expanded and then it just hangs and it dries and it hardens. Um, and then a few hours later, it's ready to fly away. There's my daughter, Lucy, uh, holding a freshly eclosed monarch. Okay, quick quiz in your head. Is that a male or a female? Dot or no dot? <laughs> I should just leave you in suspense. It's a female. Okay, so once a butterfly is adult, then it goes around and it nectars and it mates and it, lay, it lays eggs and it dies. And, and how long it lives as an adult really depends on the species. Uh, and for monarchs, it depends on the time of the year. Um, for those tiny little blues that you saw a picture of puddling, they might only live a week. Swallowtails, the, the general rule of thumb is if it's the bigger the butterfly, usually the longer it lives. It's not always the case, but it could be anywhere from a week for a teeny tiny one to months for some of the larger ones. Um, but you know, when you live in Central Oregon, you gotta contend with the weather and the winter and the different species of butterflies that we have here have different strategies of dealing with it. Some will overwinter as an egg, some as a caterpillar, um, some as like an early instar caterpillar, some later, uh, some as a chrysalis, swallowtails overwinter uh, as a chrysalis. Um, and others will overwinter as adults. And it's one of the reasons uh, some of you may have seen like on a warm winter day when we have like unseasonably warm weather, maybe it's in the 50s or 60s, you might see some California tortoiseshells or some morning cloaks flying around just taking advantage of the warmth, like the warmth kind of wakes them up, stirs them out of their sort of hibernation state. Um, and they'll fly around and then they go back in to hibernation uh, as it gets cold again. But the monarchs don't do any of these things. The monarchs just leave. <laughs> the monarchs are a tropical butterfly and they're like, I'm not dealing with this cold weather, I'm getting out of here. So let's talk about that. Fall migration. So some of the triggers for monarchs for fall migration are short, shortened length of the day, colder at night. A lot of their nectar plants are starting to senesce to die back, uh, the host plants are dying back, and they get this signal that it's, it's time to move. Um, monarchs are one of the most intrepid migrators in the insect world, I think topped only by this one um, dragonfly species in another part of the world that flies like 7,000 miles or something crazy. Um, but monarchs fly can fly thousands of miles. Here on the map you see we have sort of a separation of Eastern monarchs and Western monarchs. And it's really just a geographic one. Genetically, they're the same. But here on the map, you can see the monarchs that are east of the Rockies tend to go down to Mexico uh, for the winter. Some of them flying you know, up to 3,000 miles, up to 40 miles a day, all the way from Canada down into the Central Highlands. Our monarchs, we have Western, what's called Western monarchs, um, typically west of the Rockies. This, this dividing line of the Rocky Mountains is not as clear as it appears in the map. There is a little bit of crossover for sure. But just to make things you know, simple for explanation, um, our monarchs go to the central coast of California, 
typically um, in the fall, September, October, November, heading down there. Um, in the central coast of California, in that area, they will typically overwinter in eucalyptus, uh, cypress, palm trees. Um, there are many overwintering sites all along the coast and they're zeroing in on the coast because it's cool and damp. So their metabolisms slow down, they live off their fat reserves. If you can imagine a monarch being fat, not really, but they are much bigger. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this generation that does this migration in a minute. Um, they, their metabolism slowed down, they live off their reserves, um, and they stay moist. They um, don't dry out as easily because it is so moist on the coast. The ones that go down to Mexico, um, and, and I will say our monarchs, our Western monarchs, at this point we're in the thousands. We'll talk a little bit more about the population status um, later. In Mexico, it's millions and millions. They measure their monarch population by hectares. Um, there's just, there's so many more. And as you saw on the map, a lot more monarchs are going that way, right? There's more land east of the Rockies uh, than there is west. Um, a really cool thing about Mexico is that the arrival of the monarchs every year in Mexico coincides with the Day of the Dead. And so for centuries, people have revered and celebrated the monarchs as the returning spirits of their ancestors, which I think is amazing. So here's a picture I stole from the internet uh, showing you that. Just really incredible parades and celebrations that happen around the monarch. So the monarchs, they go to these overwintering grounds, and I should just say in Mexico, uh, the conditions that they, they gather in is very high elevation, cool, damp, oymel fir forests, um, the similar climate to that that we have on the California coast, cool and damp really important. Um, so in the spring, they start to, again, they're queuing into environmental um, factors, temperature, increasing day length, uh, plants starting to emerge. Um, and they begin this amazing leapfrog process to get north again. So in the fall, I showed you the map, they boom, they, they might fly hundreds of miles, they might fly thousands of miles, depending upon where they are, but they're just going for it. Um, in the spring, they do a leapfrog thing. So those monarchs that are flying south in the fall, they live typically six to nine months, pretty long time for a butterfly. In the spring, what happens is, I'll just use California as an example, um, some of the adults will start to feel the stirrings of spring, They'll migrate a little ways away from the overwintering grounds. They'll mate, lay eggs, and die. Then another generation emerges. So they go from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis to adult. That takes about a month. Um, the next generation will fly a little farther north, mate, lay eggs, and die. That little generation is only living two to five weeks. And again, they'll go a little farther north, mate, lay eggs, and die. And they continue to do this. It just makes me think of leapfrogging their way north. Um, so if you see monarchs, if you're one of the fortunate ones to see monarchs early in the summer, like June, July, they're the ones that are on their way up north. They're the ones that are only living two to five weeks. If you see a monarch late in the summer, like August, September, maybe even October, um, those are part of what we call the super generation. They're the ones that are migrating all the way to the overwintering grounds. So it's, it's just, it's an amazing, amazing journey for sure. Happy to answer more questions about that if you have them at the end of the presentation. So what are the challenges that the monarchs are facing? My daughter, Lucy, uh, painted this picture about a year ago when she was 12. Um, and it just tugs on my heart every time I see it, um, but it does such a good job of representing uh, the challenges that monarchs are facing. For every 160 monarchs that we used to have overwintering on the California coast, we now have one. 
We've gone from populations over the millions in the 1990s to an overwintering population that's fewer than 30,000. Um, this past winter and the winter before, uh, the Xerces Society conducts overwintering surveys um, throughout the coast of California. Um, every winter has been doing so for decades and you know the trajectory has just been going like this. Um, it's good news that it, it kind of seems like it stabilized, like it didn't go down last winter. You know, it was about 30,000 in 2017, 2018, and, or 2018, 2019, and then 2019, 2020, um, again, staying the same. We don't know what it'll be um, this year. There are certainly, um, people have been seeing monarchs throughout Oregon and into Washington, lots of um, monarchs um, and being seen in California and Arizona, Montana, but are the numbers significant enough to increase the overwintering population? We, we won't know um, until later this winter. Fingers crossed that either it'll continue to hold steady or go up a little bit. Um, some of the reasons for this incredible uh, decline in monarchs, uh, loss of overwintering habitat, you know, development pressures around overwintering grounds are a huge challenge. Climate change is a huge challenge. Um, more severe winter storms, when the winter storms blow in off the ocean and carry really heavy winds and rains, it's really, really hard for the monarchs uh, to survive those. Um, loss of milkweed, so breeding habitat, migratory corridors where they really need the milkweed. Um, and another challenge is that with associated kind of with climate change is that they're tending to emerge earlier from the overwintering grounds because it's warmer earlier. And so they're like, oh, it's time to mate and you know, start this journey north. Um, and they're having trouble finding milkweed that is in bloom yet, or is just you know, even leafing out because it's, it's so early. Um, neonicotinoids really awful systemic uh, pesticide that is used quite widely um, is a huge challenge, not only for monarchs, but um, a lot of bees. Um, so it's a systemic uh, chemical and what happens is it's applied to the plant and then it gets into the plant tissue and it's expressed in the nectar and the pollen and it's in the leaves that the caterpillars munch. And so we always encourage folks when you're purchasing plants for your home, for landscaping, or if you're building a pollinator garden, make sure that they haven't been treated with neonicotinoids, because uh, that's another big challenge. Okay, enough about the depressing stuff. Let's get on to what we can do to help. I'm a positive person. I can only handle so much of the depression. All right, there are a lot of great things you can do to help, and it's super easy. I promise, harmless, uh, painless. Uh, plant milkweed, number one. So this is the Monarch Coast plant. Remember, we have two native milkweeds in Central Oregon. Here's a picture of showy milkweed. This is when it's fully mature. So when you first plant it in your yard, it does not look this glorious. It takes a few years to achieve, to achieve this. Actually, the milkweed in my yard just bloomed for the first time this year, and it's been there for three years. Um, but anyway, it's really exciting. I put this little inset picture in here just to, to demonstrate that milkweed is not just for monarchs. It's obviously the only plant that a monarch will lay its eggs on, but it's wonder, the flowers are wonderful for bees and many other butterfly species. So this is showy. We have milkweed, uh, showy milkweed seed that we give away for free at the Land Trust. And I think Rebecca can put either um, a link in the chat where you can go to our website and request that milkweed seed be mailed to you, um, or she can do it in a follow-up email. Um, thank you, Rebecca. The other, where did my cursor go? Uh, the other type of milkweed that we have here that's native to Central Oregon is narrow leaf milkweed, which is super pretty. Um, and I really encourage people to plant both. We unfortunately don't have um, seed for narrow leaf. We're really lucky to get the seed for the showy um, milkweed uh, through a partnership we have with U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, and the Deschutes National Forest, um, but we don't have any for narrow leaf. I encourage folks to, I just checked this morning, Winter Creek native uh, 
plant nursery here in Bend is a great resource for narrow leaf. Um, I just checked their website this morning. It looks like maybe they're sold out right now, um, but definitely a great place to go in the spring. Um, and I definitely encourage you, it, it doesn't matter if you don't have a big yard, you don't need a big yard. Even if you put a couple container pots out on a balcony or at your front door um, and put a mixture of showy and narrow leaf in it, that in itself is making a big difference. Because if we can make little you know, places, little dots on a map, think of everybody that's listening in planted showy and narrow leaf in a little container pot, um, that's so much more, right, than maybe exists right now. And the more people that do that, the more of a difference we can make. And we really, we're living here in a really important part, um, important section of the monarch's migration route. Um, and just a note about native milkweed, there are numerous other non-native species that we really ask people not to plant. Tropical milkweed is a popular non-native species. It's great to plant that if you live in other parts of the country where it is native, um, but the showing the narrow leaf are much better adapted to this area. Um, so they'll have a better chance of surviving in our climate and in our soil types. Um, and it's just good to go native. So let me advance my slide. Um, Planting in clumps is really helpful. It's great to, if you have the space to plant species in addition to milkweed. I'd say if you're in an apartment or you just have a really uh, small yard, just go ahead and focus on maybe some container plants with milkweed. Another nice thing about putting it in container pots is that that will control the spread. Once milkweed gets established, like three, four years down the road from planting it, it will spread rhizomatously. So that means um, it spreads out its roots underground and shoots up other plants. So if you don't want it spreading all over your garden, you could, I, mine are in a raised bed, um, but it's good to have them spreading all over your garden too, if, if you're not uh, opposed to that. Um, if you do have a little more space, then add in some other great native plants. And we have a lot of resources on our website. Um, we have lists of pollinator friendly native plants that are really great for Central Oregon. Um, it's good to plant a variety of things that bloom spring through fall. So different butterflies emerge from their chrysalids at different times of the summer, different bees emerge at different times. So if you have blooms in your yard spring through fall, then you're catering to all the different pollinator species. Um, it's really nice to plant in clumps, like shown in this picture, so that the pollinators don't have to work super hard and go get a little drink from a flower over here and then go way over there and get another little drink. Um, so we encourage clumps. And I'm just gonna advance a slide one more. Um, and just variety, variety, not only for the bloom times, but just for the different pollinators. I know this talk is really focused on monarchs. Um, and I've been planting a bunch of milkweed in my yard, but this year because of COVID, because we were all stuck at home kind of, so I decided to just go for it and expand my pollinator garden. And the more diversity you include, the more diverse species you'll get. So more different types of butterfly species, bee species, birds, got a lot more hummingbirds this year as a result. Um, so to me, I think the number one thing you can do for monarchs is plant that milkweed and Rebecca can share a link. I can't see the chat right now uh, with how you can get seed. I will say at this point in the summer, it's probably best like you can totally get seed now, but maybe wait until next spring. Uh, to get it going. And with that, I will hand it off. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I forgot about these slides. <laughs> it's not just planting. I meant to let you know that if you don't want to plant or if you're maybe not blessed with the green thumb, if you've got kind of a brown thumb and you don't want to do the planting thing, there are other things that you can do. Um, one of them is get on our website because we've got it and just type monarch or even butterfly into the search and you'll get all kinds of cool information. Another really great website to go to is the Western Monarch Advocate website. And um, this is an amazing nonprofit. I'm on the board. Um, it's fairly new, 
And last year we hosted the first ever Western Monarch Summit down in California. And really, and so we're not getting together with anybody this year because of COVID. So we've really focused our energy on this website that I encourage you to visit because the goal for the Western Monarch Advocates is just to try to bring everybody together. There are people all over the West that are doing things in their areas for monarchs. And we wanted to create a, a forum basically for people to come together and share what they're doing. Um, so this is just a screenshot of the website and it's kind of blurry because when you go to the website, the monarchs are actually flying around, which is really awesome. Um, but you can go to the state updates, which is really cool and just see what's happening in each state. Um, anyway, a plethora of information to dig into if you wanna geek out uh, like I like to on monarchs. Um, and the Xerces Society, another incredible organization I mentioned, they're in charge of the overwintering counts. And they have this really cool milkweed and monarch mapper. And this is a very intuitive picture. Um, the orange means that a monarch has been sighted in that location. The green means milkweed has been sighted. And the purple means that a sign of breeding has been observed. So eggs or caterpillars. Um, and you can participate in this. It's citizen science at its best. Um, so anytime you see a monarch or a milkweed or a caterpillar or an egg, you can log on to their website, load up a picture and help put another data point on the map. Super important. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> now we can open it up to any questions that people have. So I'll hand it off to Rebecca. Thanks, Amanda, so much for sharing all of that great information. We were joking earlier, Amanda wore her polka dot shirt and I wore my orange bandana. So we were all monarch decked out. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining in. I'm going to start asking some questions, but before I do, I'll give Amanda just a moment to breathe. Um, and while I give folks online and, and watching live a chance to insert their last few questions in the chat, I wanted to encourage you all to consider making a donation to support the Land Trust. Your support helps protect amazing places and incredible critters like the monarchs um, that we've been learning so much about. You can become a member by donating using the Facebook donation button tool or by visiting our website at deschutzlandtrust.org slash support um, and that link is in the chat. Um, so it looks like I have a few questions here. So I will start out with a grouping of milkweed related questions. Um, so I will just send them all your way and you can come back with whatever you've got, Amanda. Um, the first one is, do the caterpillars only make a chrysalis on the milkweed? Will they put it on something else? Or is it always, always milkweed? Um, two, you touched on this. Is it too late right now to plant my milkweed seeds? Um, and then two more. What type of milkweed would be good in the Portland area? Um, there are some tools for that uh, to find that out. And then the last one, do bees like milkweed? Okay, I don't know if I'm gonna get all this in the right order. <laughs> uh, help me along, Rebecca, if I forget something. Number one, caterpillars will go into their J hook on just about anything. Uh, there, there was actually a series of really hilarious pictures of um, places that people found monarch chrysalids uh, circulating on social media a while back. Um, truly, whatever um you know if they're out in the garden they it's it's not uncommon to have them wander away i've seen pictures of chrysalids hanging off of picnic benches off of eaves on houses off of other plants um yeah anything anything that they they feel is a, a fairly stable you know surface um and hopefully protected a little bit from the elements because they're in a pretty vulnerable position you know when they're they're suspended there. Uh, is it too late um, to plant milkweed? At this point, in, first of all, in August, it's so hard to get something going. I, I feel like the temperatures can be really harsh. You don't tend to get much moisture. Um, and by the time you get something sprouting, if you're starting with a seed, you know, it's, we're gonna be going into fall. So for me, I would just wait. 
until next spring. Get a nice early start in the spring, start it inside on a nice sunny windowsill, you know, so that your plant has grown a bit and then transfer it outside, um, you know, when we're safe from frost uh, is probably your best bet. Um, lots of other insects love milkweed blooms, bees and butterflies. Um, so yeah, it's great for more than monarchs. Um, Rebecca, what am I forgetting? There was another one in there. The last one was if you have any recommendation or a resource to share oh. to find other regions, milkweed, yeah. specifically Portland. Yeah, so definitely, you definitely, if you're in Portland, please, we, we won't, well, we won't send you seed, <laughs> even if you ask. Um, you want to get local. Uh, local seed and I would tap into Xerces Society because they have a whole section of their site devoted to helping connect people with local milkweed resources. Um, you could also try the Western Monarch Advocate page. Um, I think there's a contact for the Portland area on that page so you could reach out to that person as well. Super. And like Amanda mentioned, if you are out of town, um, you're not in the local region to receive our milkweed, you can still fill out the form, but we will just send you to those resources Amanda just mentioned. Um, so if you want us to send them to you, that's a good way to get them. Um, the next question is about the chrysalis. So does the wind often blow it down? Do most of them survive? Um, that's kind of the same question, but also kind of different ones if you want to take us yeah. through survival. Yeah, yeah. well, survival, uh, well, let me answer the wind question. It is amazing what those chrysalids can survive. So they, I, I've seen them batted all over the place that within about 24 hours that the, for lack of a better term, like kind of the shell, like the chrysalis itself does become really quite firm and durable. It's, it's amazing. It's very uh, vulnerable when, it, when it's first formed, when you saw like the ridges still of the caterpillar, it, not a good time for it to get batted around. But once it's fully solidified, it's really durable. Um, that said, it can still uh, succumb to predation. Um, I will say that, and I'm sure there are situations in a super violent storm where it could be, you know, dislodged from wherever it's hanging, but it is amazingly resilient. Um, survival, this is an amazing statistic. So if a fe female monarchs lay like three to 400, sometimes more eggs, only like between two and 4% of those eggs typically survive to adulthood. Um, and that's largely due to predation. I mean, I'm talking outside of pesticides and you know other human uh, influences, but um, ants, wasps, all kinds of critters um, will attack eggs and small instar caterpillars and, and even the chrysalids. I didn't really go into that too much, but there's some, there's some natural predators out there. And you know, if the population were doing well, that would be fine. You know, it's evolved that way. Um, it's not like only two to 4% live now and it used to be that 50% lived before. It's just that our population is in such severe decline that you know every little egg that makes it really matters. And so that's why we worry so much about it. Thanks, Amanda. I actually had the opportunity, Amanda was able to show me some of those chrysalids and they really are amazing and i was really worried carol um that i was gonna break them off because i was participating in some movement that was happening but they are super sturdy um the next question is kind of two questions so how in the world do monarchs survive such a long journey that journey south and then also, is there anything physically different about the butterflies that make their winter journey um, versus the butterflies that do the leapfrogging north? Yeah. How in the world? Well, that's part of the magic. You know, as scientists, we like to try to explain everything. Um, but I have to push back against that a little bit and say there's magic involved. <laughs> I'm sticking to it. 
Um, no, it is incredible, uh, the obstacles that they overcome. They've been shown to fly through massive forest fires. You know, they're sending incredible plumes of smoke into the air. Imagine, you know, highways, all these crazy corridors with such heavy human influence. Um, it is incredible. You know, makes you think too about the salmon that migrate <laughs> from, from inland streams and rivers all the way to the ocean. These uh, lots of things in nature that um, are really amazing. Um, but the butterflies that make the journey, the super generation, I like to call them the super G's, um, they are different physically. They actually, they're larger, they tend to be larger and they assimilate um, nutrients differently. They actually pack on, you know, more, what do you want to call it? I don't know what to call it for butter. It's not more beef, more muscle. Um, and they, they are, they're just incredible. They're built to fly long distances. Um, and I've seen the difference between the leapfrog generations and the super G's and you can see it. It's, it's really incredible. I always thought um, when I was younger, I, I've loved butterflies my whole life. And I used to think that they would just get tossed about in the wind. They had no control over, you know, where they ended up. They're just kind of out there getting blown around. And it's really amazing. Monarchs aren't the only really strong flyers. They are super, obviously super strong and the only ones that migrate these distances. But swallowtails are impressively strong as well. Some of the other large butterflies. Can't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> Great. Um, then I will move us to another question. Um, what do I do if I spot a monarch butterfly? Now I'm assuming that this person has now um, learned which butterflies are monarchs and which ones aren't. Um, so what do you do? And then we, the Land Trust, have posted some photos where monarchs have tags on them. Um, how do you tag a butterfly? You keep, at, it's like, you're really testing my brain power, Rebecca, one at a time. Uh, <laughs> tagging a monarch, totally different. Um, what do you do? Number one, what do you do? You call me, cause I wanna come see it. <laughs> uh, you jump for joy. Um, if you can, really quickly whip out your phone. And if you're like me, you have a Land Trust Butterfly Brigade sticker on the back of it. Yeah, <laughs> you'd snap a photo and definitely register it on the Xerxes uh, webpage, that Milkweed and Monarch Mapper. It's so important uh, that we work together to try to map these sightings so that we can get a better handle on where the butterflies are, how the population is doing. Um, but a little bit rejoicing, a little photography if possible. If you can't get a good photo, um, I don't, I think that on that Xerces website, I think you have to have a photo in order to be able to log a data point, but you could certainly reach out and let them know, reach out to us and let us know where you are, you know, where you were, where you saw it, maybe what it was doing. If it was just kind of, boom. you know, in the fall, when you see a monarch, they're just like, boom. They're going, they got a place to, <laughs> they got things to do, places to go. Um, but it is really exciting for sure. And please do try to snap a photo of it if you can and, and get it on that map. That's exciting stuff and share it with us for sure. Um, then how do you tag a monarch? Uh, gracious, uh, it's, it's um, tricky. Um, but doable, not as bad as, as it might seem. Um, I didn't include any photos of that in this particular presentation, but um, I studied butterflies for my master's research. So I got used to being really careful um, and handling and not harming butterflies. Um, when it comes to tagging monarchs, which is something that we do to try to learn more about the species and the population and the, the migration patterns. Um, I work with David James. Dr. David James is a researcher at Washington State University and he's in charge of all of the tagging that happens in our region. Um, and the tags that he um, sends out to folks that are involved in this are like, um, they're really sticky like the the tags that are on a piece of fruit in a grocery store, but even stickier than that, and they're waterproof. Um, and so you very, very carefully have to 
hold the monarch. Um, and, you know, I kind of have it between all the wings between my fingers like this. Um, and very gently, but also kind of firmly, you're pressing that tag on the wing. Um, and then you release it. And the tag does, the Dr. David James, um, his analogy, I think, is that it's, it's like a person carrying uh, car keys in your pocket. Like you can feel that they're there, but it, they don't weigh you down. That's kind of how the tag is for the monarch. Apparently he asked one. <laughs> no, but it does not impair their flight at all. Now all I'm doing is imagining a bunch of monarchs driving around in little cars. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little Prius or something. I don't know. <laughs> Um, well, we have a, a few more minutes and I want to sneak in two more questions. Um, so one is my personal question and I'll start with that. Um, what did it feel like um, getting to see the monarch overwintering grounds recently? Um, for those folks who don't know, Amanda had the chance to visit some overwintering grounds of monarchs for the first time. Um, and we actually have, uh, she did an interview down there, but uh, maybe she could share a little bit about that experience. Um, it was like the first time I saw the Grand Canyon. Uh, just, it's kind of beyond words. I'm going to tear up a little bit now. <laughs> um, it's incredible. Even, even in the state that the overwintering grounds are in, in Central Oregon, um, which is severely depleted, I was fortunate enough to see several thousand, which of course for me was more than I had seen in my entire life combined. Um, at the same time, I saw the overwintering monarchs for the first time. I was also meeting Dr. David James in the flesh for the first time, as well as John Dayton, who was the one, uh, he's a scientist and a, and a photographer down in Santa Cruz, that is the one that found one of the monarchs that I released in Bend. Who maybe some of you know about this particular monarch that my son named Flamingo <laughs> and made the journey. Uh, it was a tagged monarch, uh, tagged here at my house, released in Bend, made it down to the overwintering ground. I was hoping I'd get to see Flamingo. Sadly, I did not. But it was just this crazy experience where I was seeing these thousands of monarchs meeting these two heroes of mine in monarch conservation. So to say it was overwhelming would be an understatement. <laughs> I was, I felt like I was flying like a monarch. Uh, it was incredible. And it was a nice warm um, day. So they, the monarchs were, you know, some of them were um, clumped together and hanging in cypress uh, branches um, and others were flitting about you know, and landing on the ground really close to me. It was, it was incredible. I highly recommend that you all experience this. <laughs> yeah. I hope to. Uh, every time I've heard you share anything about it, I'm like, ah, I gotta see it. Um, the last question I will ask um, as we're closing down our time here um, is what makes you feel the most hopeful about monarchs and um, monarch conservation and if you have any final <clears throat> words to share thanks so much Amanda I know there were a couple of questions that went unasked folks so um, those ones about milkweed will be sure to follow up closing words um, what what makes me hopeful well I'm a hopeful person um, at heart um, I will say uh, I think the most amazing thing about this, the, the thing that gives me the most hope is that there, there's so much a craziness going on in the world today. And it can become very overwhelming uh, in not a good way. Um, and, and make you feel like you can't do anything to make a difference. And I feel like with monarch conservation, it's as easy as planting a milkweed. I mean, it's, it's one of those things I think that's very empowering because here's a situation where you really can make a difference. In one small container pot on your doorstep, you're making a difference. Even if a monarch you know, doesn't pass by, um, you are helping other pollinator species and there are so many pollinator species in our area that need our help. Um, so you might get lucky and get a monarch. And in the meantime, you know, you're helping other bees and butterflies. And 
I, I love that sense of empowerment. And it also, I think, helps us feel more connected um, as a community, you know, that we're working together. Um, when you look at climate change as a whole and all the other things going on in the environment, it's, I find myself often at a loss to know what can I do to make a difference. And here is a really easy one, plant some milkweed. <laughs> yeah, makes you feel good. Super, and we will absolutely be sharing um, some more re references and resources for folks interested in getting involved and also folks interested in learning more. Those will be in a follow-up email from this presentation and also on our website. Um, thank you all for joining us and I sure hope you can tune in again sometime to learn more about the nature of Central Oregon from the comfort of your own home or from your colleague's old office. Like me. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter, check out our upcoming virtual events or make a donation at DeschutesLandTrust.org. Um, thanks again. Thank you, Amanda, so much for joining in this butterfly talking time and uh, we'll see you all again soon. Thank you so much for joining. This recording will be available in case you didn't take notes um, and hope you can come again. Thank you. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. Bye.